Hey everybody, how are we doing today? This is Split Suit. Um, today I'm going to be doing a video for my site and 2 plus 2, and this is going to be a site on how to use Poker Stove and how to use Stocks Poker Combo. Both are very powerful pieces of software that we can use in both pre-session and post-session analysis. Um, some of the things that they can do we should be able to do in our heads or off the top of our heads very quickly. Um, I'll show you kind of how to, to shortcut that in a little bit. But really, these are very, very powerful pieces of information to study equities and ranges and help us kind of figure out optimal plays or near optimal plays um, in certain situations. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. So on the left, you have a C Poker Stove, which I believe you can get at PokerStove.com. And the other one is Stocks Poker Combo, which you can get off the Stocks website, which I believe is StocksPoker.com. So very, very simple uh, to download. Both are free, I believe. I know Poker Stove is, I believe, Stocks Poker combo is as well with this um, decided not to do with the the selling thing and did it for free which in my opinion is awesome because the program is pretty fucking sweet in my opinion um, and whenever I do any sort of work with this I always get out a notepad document and my calculator because uh, my I suck at doing math real quick off the top of my head so I just keep them up so I can do things nice and easy and I don't have to be an idiot and suck at math because the first try I did at this I think I messed up like 19 different calculations that were like 18 plus 14 so instead of doing that I'll just bring my calculator out so I feel less retarded so first we will take a look at poker stove now this is kind of going to be a twofold this is going to be semi tutorial this is going to be somewhat how to use this for correct decisions etc so first we we'll do just the basic tutorial stuff so poker stove is pretty simple you well it looks pretty simple to me but that's because I've used it so if I believe the first time I looked at it I was very confused so if this is your first time using this program I can definitely understand if you're a little bit confused but it's pretty simple once you get used to it so but anyways what you do is for player one you pick out some sort of hand you can do hands in two different ways you can pick two specific cards or you can pick preflop ranges um, both of them are very helpful but really what I would do is if you are player one I would just enter in whatever hand you have and then pick out a range for player two because generally you're not going to know the exact hand for a certain person if you do say you're just doing uh, what does a set look like versus a nut flush draw, well that's different, you're just running a, a quick calculation for that. But if you're actually trying to do an in-game analysis like you would if you were playing, then it's generally a little bit better if you pick in terms of ranges. And obviously they have some, some preset selections up here, so we can do any pair, we can do any Broadway, we can do any suited, and we can do all. Pretty simple. Um, if you're going to do suited hands and say it's a two spade board and you think the only part of their range that would continue are two spades, say they have eight six, well then you would deselect the clubs, deselect the diamonds, deselect the hearts, and then you're only left with spades back. Another cool thing you can do is you can use the slider bar. So let's say you know that someone steals at roughly 35%, which means they're stealing roughly 35% of their hands. So we would move this over to 35% to get a rough idea of what 35% looks like. In reality, we'd probably add in the rest of the pocket pairs, scuff out a couple of the crap hands, and we're left with, sorry, roughly 35%. So a couple of different ways we can use that. So, obviously, you pick the hands. If you don't know their hand and you just want to test it against the random hand, push the RD, which just means random. And then you can, you obviously have to select a board to get equities. But you can also do preflop equities. So, say you want to do queen jack suited against the random hand, just go to evaluate. And it gives you the, the, the pump out of 6040. So, also down below, you'll notice that some numbers come up. This is just giving you exactly what you just pumped out. It tells you what hand versus what range. Um, how many times it won, how many times it tied, etc., and then what your general equity is. So this is actually very, very helpful to go over later in case you forget to write it down. Also, Poker Stove, I believe when you're running it, will open up a document on your desktop and save everything that you've ever done. So if you decide to go back a couple weeks later, forget some hand calculation you ran, it's pretty easy to, to go find it again. Um, also, if you decide to pick a board, you have to actually pick the exact board card. So just say we pick those two, do an evaluation, and this is our equity against a certain range. You can also input dead cards. For online, I've never once used a dead card. It's not like uh, cards get exposed online very often. Uh, however, let's say you were at a, doing an analysis on a live hand, and somehow during the dealing process, the deuce of spades—I'm sorry, the deuce of hearts—was flashed. Then you just go here, 
enter that, and then you recalculate it. Uh, we also notice down here you have two different kind of evaluation methods. You can do enumerate or you can do Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is kind of just uh, kind of like just dealing out the simulations and the number gets bigger and bigger. So notice it's dealing out a certain amount of hands. So this number will change. And as the, the number of million hands gets larger, obviously the results will converge on the exact number. Um, I don't really care about doing stuff like that. So I just keep it at enumerate all. So I just get my, my quick pump out because that's all I care about. Okay, so this is the pretty basics, obviously clear all. So you can use this for plenty of things. You can do this just to see what uh, what a nut flush draw looks like against a uh, set. So in case you've never done this before, pick a hand where someone has fives. Pick a board where, I don't know, give me a heart, give me a heart, give me a five. Awesome. And you see that's what we have. So also in case you've never done something like this before, switch it okay so obviously oops must have picked a hand that was in there so I'll pick five seven good evaluate it so you notice we're ahead um notice if we were behind say the four in case you've never done this before i'm sure most of you have but just in case you haven't so notice this is what our equity looks like at the moment and in case you've never done this <laughs> uh, notice how bad our equity tanks off if uh, another card comes off when we have one card to come so just in case you've never done basic equity calculations before, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay, so this is the bare basics on how to use the program. And in just one second, we'll look over kind of how to use this to our advantage and how to talk about range merging and things like that. So uh, be back in one second, we'll start talking about that. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how to use this program for some decisions that we want to make. So obviously we can use this to our advantage when we're, especially in, in pre-flop scenarios. I, I use Poker Stove a lot when I'm thinking about my 3-bets, uh, my 3-bet range, and also my 3-bet sizing. So let's just take a, a basic spot where this example over here, say villain decides to open steal for $4 at a 100 no limit game, small blind folds, and we 3 bet up to 12 bucks, which means we are risking 12 to win 4.5, so it has to work roughly 72% um, of the time, and here's just a basic math write up in case you've never done this before. So let's take a normal range of villain steals. So let's say villain steals roughly 30% of hands. So we're adding the rest of the shit pocket pairs, kick out some of the crap. Okay, so here's 30% of hands. We notice it's deuces plus, uh, ace seven off plus, ace deuce plus, etc. So it's a pretty wide range. So we know that 30% of hands equal 100% of his range. Pretty simple. So now we want to think about what's his continuance range, aka if we three bet here, what is going to continue on in the hands. Well, obviously the entire thing is not going to continue. He'll probably continue with, say, tens plus, ace, queen plus. Okay, this is a little bit on the looser side. Generally, at full ring, people tend to be uh, jacks plus, ace, king. Sometimes even just queens plus, ace, king, especially in a positional pot. But as the game tends to get more aggro, we're we'll just say tens plus, ace, queen plus works just fine. So we we'll notice that that equals 4.7. So 4.7 percent of hands equal 100 percent of his cont range which obviously just stands for continuation range, which means 4.7 divided by 30 equals, pull out our fancy little calculator, and I'm just doing this all, I would have done this all out by, in advance, but I really wanted to do it with, with you guys, so in case you've never done things like this before, you can see how it's done, and I'm not just skipping steps, so it's actually helpful for you. So roughly 16% of the time, he will continue. So, which means, obviously, conversely, that 84% of the time he will fold. So, notice that it's going to work roughly 84% of the time. It only needs to work 72% of the time to be profitable. So, we are making an instant profit every single time we 3-bet him. Notice not once did we even talk about what our hand is. All we're talking about are the sizes, his frequencies, his continuation range. Our hand doesn't matter because by itself we could 3-bet any two cards and it will be profitable for this. Now obviously this changes as this player, person gets more aggressive. And what I want to talk about right now is something called variable effect. And variable effect is um, 
adding in for the times that you miscalculate his range. So for instance, we think that this is his logical aggression range. Well, obviously there's going to be some times where he's going to light forebed us, or he is going to come along with a lighter hand, or he's just going to forebed any two cards, etc. So we always want to add in just a couple of shit hands just to, or just a couple of random hands just to balance out the times that we're incorrect in the range analysis. Now, the more aggressive they are, the looser they are, generally the wider and more hands you want to add into that variable effect. So for your standard person like this, in this kind of a spot, I would probably add in four extra hands. So pumps the range up to roughly 8.3. So 8.3 divided by 30 equals... It's going to be roughly double, but I'll just do it out anyway. So... 28%, <clears throat> which means 72% of the time he folds, and it needs to work 72% of the time. So even if you account for a massive amount of uh, variable effect, you're still profitable to do this to a slight extent. Now obviously you probably don't want to be doing this every single time, they're going to catch on, which means their range changes, but against your standard person that opens a very wide amount of hands, this is kind of how we can use Poker Stove to figure out just basically how often we should be doing this, and is it profitable to do it by itself with any two cards? Obviously we just saw that it is. This does not mean you should 3-bet with any two cards in every situation. I cannot stress this enough, that would just be retarded you will get pounded for it. Um, also notice, in case you've this is your first time really doing this, um, also notice what happens if we change the steel range. So just say we take a normal tag range of 20%, and that makes up roughly 20. So we're changing it, and notice that it still needs to work 72% of the time, because none of the bet sizing stuff is changed at all. So 20.4 equals 100% of the range. And we're obviously, if he is raising less, generally it's going to be a smaller continuance range. So we're account for that, account for just a tad bit of variable effect. So 4.8. So obviously we go 4.8 divided by 20.4. Really wish I had my keyboard set up. That would make this a shit ton easier. 20.4 equals 23. Yeah, we're just say 24. So, roughly 76% of the time it needs to work, it's going to work 72%. So, we're not that far off. But also notice if we take out the variable effect, it changes things drastically, and now this is roughly only going to be like 19%. So, um, just notice how the, the frequencies change and what the, how the continuation range changes. Remember, the tighter they are, generally the thinner the continuation range, but also the thinner the opening range. So I know some people think that they can 3-bet a tag post-flop as often as they want, which is true to an extent. How often, you always have to remember that as you get more information in a hand, the range is supposed to get smaller. If you're going forward in a hand, you're just constantly picking random-ass hands and throwing them into this grab bag that you call their range, that's not going to be a profitable thing to do, and generally you're going to get killed for that. So I would not suggest doing that. So in in quick recap, this is basically how we can use Poker Stove to do basic uh, range analysis, especially for preflop. And again, notice that we're not looking at hands at all. Um, another quick thing you always want to do preflop is kind of figure out what um, what random hands look like against the very strong parts of their range. So for instance, let's say we take this situation. He goes to three. We go to twelve. He goes to I don't know thirty. Um, what hands can we profitably shove over the top of them with? Well, obviously it depends how light their forebed is, but you can use Poker Stove to do that as well. Another situation I like to do is, um, say, I put the situation in the, in the other place. So I steal for four, I get three bet up to 12. What do I profitably want to four bet with? Also, which of the hands that I four bet with can I profitably call a five bet shove? Um, hands like that would be, let's take a hand where I have, I don't know... We're seeing my favorite hand, 7-9 suited. Okay, and we're saying that they have a range of, say they're going to shove queens plus ace-king. Pretty standard shove range. See what my hand looks like. So now let's take a standard spot where I go to 4, they go to 12, I go to 30, and I actually don't know if these numbers are correct. I'm just throwing them out there. And he shoves. That means we are calling 70. I'm just obviously assuming full stacks to make 130. 
So a little less than two to one. We need a little bit more than two to one to feel comfortable here, so I can't profitably call that. But let's say I make my four bet up to 39. Then obviously I'm calling 61 to make 139. And now all of a sudden, look, I can make a call profitably. And of course, by profitably, I mean break even, but it's still more profitable than folding, just given what you've already put in and assuming that the range is correct. Now, notice what happens if we add in more pocket pairs here. Notice that our range drops. If you can add in more bear over cards, then our hands goes up. So it's important to understand how this works against their range, both in terms of what our hand is against what their range is. And also, um, you can factor in a little bit of variable effect here, and I sometimes will, um, but it, you can't f f factor in that much more. So let me just go quick back here just to the queens plus ace king. Um, also just notice what happens if you pick a hand that is uh, directly connected that we have better equity. Before it was 29, now it's 31. And obviously we're still going to be doing just fine if we add in the other stuff as well. So we're doing just, just fine. All we need to be getting is roughly 2 to 1 to be able to make this call at a break-even, but more profitable than folding scenario. So again, this is just another way you can use Poker Stove, and I'll be back in just a second to talk about some other ways that we can use this program. All right, now let's do uh, the kind of the next step of what we just did. We can start doing weighted ranges a little bit. And weighted ranges are very helpful as far as figuring out. It kind of incorporates a little bit of variable effect, but it also gives us a better idea and a more concrete answer as to what their range is and what our equity is based on that range. So obviously the first thing we want to do is we want to obviously know what the hell our hand is. So we'll just say that we have queens because queens are a pretty good example of this. And let's say we are in a preflop situation where we know that they are going to stack off and we are going to stack off as well if the equity is correct. And we know that they have a pretty aggressive preflop um, stab range. I'm sorry, continuation range. So let's say that majority of the time, we're say 70% of the time, they will have this range. So they will have 99 plus, ace, queen plus, which is a pretty pretty active range. Um, and we know that they will stack this off and we will stack our hand off. So first we want to do a, an equity evaluation. So 70% of the time, we are going to have 58% equity. And the other 30% of the time, we're going to say that their range is going to be tighter. So sometimes they're going to snuggen up, and they're only going to commit with jacks plus ace-king. Okay? And against that, we are jacks plus ace-king. Oops. Good. And we are going to have roughly 47% equity. Okay? So now what we do is we do 0.7 times 0.58 plus 0.3 times 0.47 and then we add all this fun stuff up so I'll do that real quick 0.7 times 0 0.58 uh, 0.46 plus um, obviously there would be parentheses in here but we're not in a fifth grade math class so I figured I didn't have to put them in um, plus 0.141. Uh, and obviously this, 0.406. We are going to have roughly 55% equity in this hand, so we are more than comfortable committing even against this weighted range where we are not doing as great against the Jax plus Ace King, but we're still doing okay. So um, this is kind of how you can start doing weighted equity ranges. And obviously sometimes this can be very helpful. You can say 95% of the time or 90% of the time, they're going to have this very tight range of maybe Queens plus Ace King. And say the other 10%, they're going to have a much wider range, say closer to 20% of hands. And that accounts for a lot of variable effect. And a lot of the times that they just decide to go absolutely ape shit and start firing in money with those light four bets and such. So it accounts for variable effect just in a slightly different manner than we would, and this is a little bit more precise because we're talking about weighted ranges, and you can only do this when you have a really concrete idea of what their range and frequencies are. If you're playing against an unknown, you don't have any damn clue. So you really can't use a weighted range to properly figure out how to
to extract from that person. However, let's say you've had maybe 3,000 hands against somebody, they're slightly irregular and you guys have a lot of history, well then you can start weighting ranges in the appropriate manner and making plays based on that. So again, this is just uh, another way that you can figure out your, your equity against ranges and use that to our advantage. And if you think about um, professional no limit hold'em, obviously the big thing that they were stressing was the REM uh, range equity maximize. So this is talking about building up ranges, this is talking about figuring out the equity upon that, and then figuring out how to extract upon that in the most plus EV manner possible. So um, hopefully this is helping as, as far as building a baseline for that. And obviously we're, we're looking at a couple more things as well, but this is kind of the basics of, of looking at your equity and then also weighting it and figuring out your equity against the weighted range as well. All right, guys, now I want to go over something called Stocks Pugger Combo, which is another great software program, in my opinion, and can be used in conjunction with Pugger Stove very, very well for post-session analysis and even pre-session analysis. Um, it's very, very similar to Pugger Stove from what we already saw earlier as far as picking out hands. So obviously, here's the basic hand picker. Um, you can pick based on same thing, a couple of different presets, any Broadway, any suited, any pair, same thing. You can also pick by top percentage of hands. So if you wanted to do top... 8% of hands, there it is. You can do obviously the bottom as well, so you can ship it over this way, come over here, and then you can do the bottom 10% of hands. You can even do the middle 10% um, of hand or middle 80% of hands if that's really what you wanted to do. So you can do a whole bunch of different cool things with this. So obviously, let's just do another thing where just do all pairs, ace, queen. Uh, let's just pick our hand where say we have fours. And let's do board cards of, it doesn't really matter, we'll just do it on an ace high flop. Okay? So what this does is this is kind of a next step to Poker Stove. So yes, we picked out the our whole cards, we picked out the board cards, we picked out what their range looks like. And But now what this tells us is this helps with continuance range quite a bit. So what we do is we pick their continuance range from this group over here, the opponent group. So let's say we think he's going to continue with top pair. He's going to continue with trips and sets. And that's pretty much all he can have from this range. So what we've done here is picked out his range, our whole cards, board cards, and then figured out what he's going to continue with, top pair and trips. You can also pick different groups if you really want, um, but what I generally pick is just only the continuance range ones, the ones I really care about. So I go to evaluate, and then it gives me this fun little uh, printout and shows me that... 10.2% of the time he's going to have trips or a set, and 27.3% of the time he's going to have top pair. So if I think his continuance range is top pair plus trips plus, then I think he's going to continue roughly 37.5% um, of the time. So that's, that's good to know, which means roughly one in three times he's going to continue. Now if we go back to opponent range and say we don't think he's going to continue with um, top pair always. So what we can do is we can get rid of some of the top pairs, and obviously that will change his range quite a bit, and then we can still evaluate. Because the opponent groups isn't quite complex enough to be able to say top pair, top kicker, etc., we just do this instead. So do a quick evaluation, and we notice that it changes quite drastically. So now it's almost 12% for trips and almost 16% for top pair. So now we're looking at a little higher, like 28% roughly, which means that we're getting closer to 1 in 4 times he's going to continue as opposed to the 1 in 3 from the previous example. So we can kind of work with continuance range and start thinking about some, some very basic... Um, plays and thought processes from here. So we notice that the continuance range is very low on these ASI boards. Um, so we can raise people's C bets on these quite often if we choose to. Um, obviously, this would not be useful against an idiot that can't think because he's never going to fold out more pocket pairs. I'm sorry, he's never going to fold out all the pocket pairs and he's never going to fold out top pair. So his continuance range is going to be much wider. So he's going to continue closer to 40 to 50% of the time as opposed to this guy who's only uh, continuing about half that. Okay, so this is one way to use Pugger, uh, Pugger Stocks Combo, which is a pretty nice way. Um, and here's uh, another thing we're going to do with it. So we'll do a quick exercise, and we'll do this example over here that I just wrote up. Say we raise five times the big blind with ace-queen suited in a 1-2 game. Okay, so obviously I don't really suggest raising five times if you've ever read any of my stuff, but we're just 
we'll just stick with it for now. And we'll say that a very loose, weak, passive half stacker calls us. So $100 in a 1-2 game, pretty simple. And we decide to pot size C bet on a flop of six of spades, deuce of spades, nine X, and we get called. So obviously we have ace queen of spades, we have two overcards, we have our nut flush draw, which is awesome. And on the turn, now we're on a pot that's roughly $66, and we have roughly $68 back. So roughly one SPR, so we're pretty much committed to the pot. And obviously we we break the turn, so the turn comes a deuce X. So now we want to figure out should we shove or should we not shove? So we take out this basic formula, which is obviously profit equals size of the pot times the percentage that we win it, minus the size of the bet times the percentage that we lose it. Because obviously, um, all we can win when we're betting is the pot, and when we're we're betting, um, all we can lose is the size of our bet. We can't lose. We don't lose everything else because the pot's already out there. So it's not like when we bet, we're losing our stack plus the pot, we're only losing what we put into the pot. Just like when we bet, we're only winning what's in the middle, not the middle plus our bet, because that's the bet's ours just like the pot is the pot's. Uh, okay, so now let's do a very basic thing and we'll run it through Sox Combo. So let's say that he's going to have any pair, and he's going to have pretty much every suited connector plus, and he's going to have a very wide range of continuance. So all pocket or all flush draws, flush draws, all trips, obviously. We're say he's never gonna fold a pair. And we're say he'll have full houses as well. Because obviously um, the board we picked out earlier was deuce of spades, six of spades, deuce x, nine x. Okay. And we're say our whole cards are obviously a spades, queen of spades. And this is what we have. So obviously, if he has trips, he turned uh, a boat. So it's it's pretty simple. So now we do a quick evaluation. I'm sorry, and he'll also continue with two pair. So pretty simple. So let's do a quick evaluation, and we'll notice what we have here. So roughly any pair is going to be 59.4. Um, but da, 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 da. did I do this right? Did I take two pair? Okay, I did. Okay, good. Okay, so this is what we have. So 60% of the time, he's going to continue with his pair, and obviously the rest of these he's going to continue with as well. So if we add these up real quick, comes out to like 60 plus 12.5 plus 7.8 plus 4.7. So we're notice that he's continuing roughly 85% of the time. Now we can obviously account for sometimes he's going to fold out some pocket pairs, uh, the bricks, so we'll just get rid of some of them and evaluate again, and we'll notice that it drops off significantly. So we're just going to say that he continues roughly um, 31, what number did I pick? 31% of the time, and then he's going to continue roughly 69% of the time. So I kind of I uh, negotiated between this uh, number and the one we just did with all pocket pairs calling. Okay, so 31% of the time he's going to fold out, which means we pick up the pot right there. I'm sorry, 28% of the time. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Okay, so he's going to continue 28% of the time, This and this is from the negotiation, and he's going to continue 72% of the time. So 20% of the time he folds, 72% of the time he continues. And that number, the 72, is taken from a negotiation between this calculation and the one we just did. Okay, so obviously we write the formula out as 66 times 28% minus 68 times 72%. And, but also we have to calculate sometimes we are going to shove, he's going to call with a better hand, and we are going to suck out. So obviously this is very, very important for us, and we need to put this in the calculation as well. So we do 28% of the time, we win $66, plus 72% of the time is when he calls. But also when he calls, we, we're going to have some amount of equity. So if we take it over to Poker Stove, obviously we have Ace, Queen of Spades. I did a continuance range of every pair plus... Um, and all suited connectors plus in spades. So three, four suited, all in spades. And then what I chose from the stocks poker combo that you saw earlier. And obviously the board cards are deuce, six, 30 deuce, 39. Okay, and do a quick evaluation. And you notice that we have roughly 31% equity when we, when we get called. So 72% of the time we're gonna have 31% equity and we're gonna pick up the bet 
um, I'm sorry, the pot plus his call. And we're also going to lose 72% of the time when he calls. We're going to lose that 69% of the time, and we're going to lose the size of our bet. So we do a quick calculation here. We notice we have 18 and a half, which is these two numbers. Then we have 30, which is this set of numbers. And then we have minus 34, which is this set of numbers. And obviously, all this comes out together to be plus $14. So we're making a profit every single time we shove here. And this is just another way that you can use these two programs. So notice that we use them together. We figure we use poker stocks poker combo to figure out the continuance range, how often he's going to continue in the pot. And then we use poker stove to figure out when he does decide to continue, uh, what does our equity look like against that? So we can figure out how often it has to work by itself, just a normal bet. And then when it does get called or gives gets future action, how much equity do we have? And do we really want to be making that bet in the first place? And obviously this is how you do the very basic math. So if you ever need to do a problem like this in the future, this is the basic formula you would work with. And I also did some of this work in the my Puba. So if you haven't read that, I suggest reading that as well because it goes over some of the, the basics of this formula and how to use it, especially in terms of C betting. Um, so again, this is just just another way we can use these two programs. Uh, I really like stocks uh, poker combo mostly for uh, continuance range, like I said, and I mostly use poker stove for preflop continuance range and pre-flop equities as well as post-flop equities against uh, general ranges, especially if I'm unsure if someone's holding a flush draw or if they're holding an overcard um, or over pair type stuff. So again, you can use that weighted range to figure out, okay, maybe 20% of the time they have a flush draw, maybe 60% of the time they have an over pair, and maybe the other 20% of the time they have shit. So obviously that 20% of the time they're going to fold. Against the flush draw, I have this amount of equity. Against their over pair, I have this amount of equity. And here's how I can go forward from there. So again, both of these programs, in my opinion, are very, very helpful, very useful. I suggest messing with them both at least a little bit. They're very helpful. Um, and same thing as usual. If you guys you know, mess around with this a little bit, end up getting confused on how to use either program, have questions on it. Uh, I'm not really the definitive voice of software by any stretch of the imagination, but I'd be happy to help you with what I know if I can, So, or try to point you in the right direction on how to get the help you want or need. Um, so same as usual, thank you very much for watching my video. Um, again, if you have questions, put it in the thread send me an email do whatever you need to do and I'd be happy as happy as a clam to help you out so hopefully this is just an add-on to my poobah post and hopefully this is uh, the start of a really awesome concept series so hopefully everyone enjoys that quite a bit and hopefully you enjoy the first video as well so thank you very much for watching like usual and have a have a happy February so best of luck with everything guys and thanks for watching bye